right, we are live on YouTube. Great. And we are live on Zoom. Good morning, everybody who's joining us. We're going to have a great session today. Please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. And have some of you been to every session live? I'm kind of getting curious about that as well. Uh, make sure to make uh, change your setting to all panelists and attendees. Okay, it is 9.30, so I'd like to go ahead and get started right on time. Welcome everybody to our K-12 Online Teaching Academy. We're super excited to have you here this morning. And I'm Stephanie Eichley Chang, and Brian Chung Dooley and I will be co-hosting. Brian's back today. If you're with us yesterday, it was a little bit different, but we're back and running smoothly this morning. So I would like to go ahead and introduce our presenter today. We have Eric Cross coming to us. He's a seventh grade science teacher at Albert Einstein Academy. And he is also uh, a adjunct professor at University of San Diego. So he has a great session for us today on Tequity, culturally responsive teaching in the 21st century classroom. So before I hand it over to him, I'd like to go over our announcements. Recording of this event will be available Afterwards, you'll have access to this. Captions are available. If you just look at the Zoom um, bar on the bottom, you can press the button and you can have access to those. Your video and audio are automatically turned off. So please communicate with us using the chat or in the Q&A and Eric will take some questions along the way. Um, if you'd like to talk to a community of educators, you can go ahead and join the Facebook group or the LinkedIn group right there that uh, links are in the chat, I believe. Yep, Brian dropped them right in. And afterwards, Eric is going to be joining us in the debrief session today. So if you wanna pop over and discuss further at 10.30, we'll be doing that as well. So I would like to turn it over to Eric now. Eric, welcome. Thanks, Stephanie. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, teachers, educators, people who care about kids. Um, it's great to be here. My name is Eric Cross. I'm a seventh grade science teacher at a school called Albert Einstein Academy Middle School. International baccalaureate, it's a lot to say. Uh, we're just east of downtown San Diego. I have the privilege of teaching 200 students, seventh graders, 36 per class every day. I'm full time in the classroom. Um, and then when I'm not doing that, um, I get to teach the big ones at the University of San Diego uh, in the souls department. Um, doing uh, teaching and learning for pre-service teachers and teachers who are just now getting out into the field, getting to the education sector and getting your credential. I can tell you that you're probably not getting into a better time. There's no better time to get into education than this when there's so much focus on the things that we've been talking about for years. And now we're actually at a point where the attention and the energy and hopefully the funding is getting put towards serving the kids that need us most. Uh, the session's called Techwity. It's designed to help equip you with some tools and some mindsets on how to better serve the needs of all of our students. And when we do sessions like this, sometimes it can feel like uh, you're drinking from a fire hose. And don't worry, everything that I cover today is going to be in a document with links and resources and tutorials on how to go over all that stuff. So just sit and get and if anything resonates with you, just maybe write it down or just take, take a mental note. Because at the end, you're going to have all the resources, even more than I have time to cover in an hour. There's no way we can talk about cultural responsive teaching just in an hour because there's so much to it. Um, so this is going to go designed to kind of go wide, um, but not as super deep 
because differentiating for hundreds of people, as you could imagine, doing it in our own classroom was tough. Um, I want to make sure that I give enough tools that helps meet everyone that's that's watching this video live and uh, watching this video in the recording. So when we went distance learning, um, I kind of thought about how education's been done, and and from the past hundred years, uh, I kind of thought about this Amish horse and buggy. And when we went distance learning in in, uh, in March, it was interesting the mindsets that were happening. We went from the horse and buggy era to the electric car era. I would say it was that big of a jump for a lot of educators and a lot of leaders, especially. Uh, people who've been in education, they've been in the game for a long time, but the game hadn't changed a whole lot. But with technology, it went from being a novelty to a necessity. And a lot of people were asking the question, and it was an interesting question, um, it, it was like they were trying to take the traditional model of teaching and learning and applying it in this new setting. And that's kind of like, asking where you put the bridle on the electric car. For those of you that aren't horse people, the bridle is the thing that you use to turn the horse uh, or the saddle on the electric car. And we were asking the wrong questions. Um, and, and one of the questions that I think we should be asking uh, is, is how do the identities and experiences of our students, how is that represented in our, in our pedagogy and our curriculum? Now this, this is kind of how we should frame when we think about technology and equity. Because all of the tools that I shared today in and of themselves, they're not good or bad, and they don't provide more or less equity. They're just tools. Just like a chisel in, the, in my hands, I'm not going to be able to sculpt something amazing, but you put it in the hands of Michelangelo and he can create amazing art. These tools, equipped with the person who has the heart of seeking to find ways to connect with students, create an inclusive environment, and have the conversations that matter, these tools will help launch them and go even further, not only in the rigor of their content, but in the relationships of their classroom. And there's a quote from a UC Berkeley professor, John Powell, and he said, we're conflicted inside of ourselves, um, which we almost never talk about. And we project that out. Part of the struggle is not just getting along or fixing the other person, but getting along with different aspects of ourselves. So this becomes not just a political or psychological journey, but a profoundly spiritual journey. And as an educator in this space right now, um, especially for myself, I'm a first generation uh, high school graduate, first generation college graduate, same thing for my master's. Uh, a lot of firsts I check off. Uh, my, my identity is I'm uh, heterosexual, bi or, uh, heterosexual. Um, I identify as a black male, I'm biracial. Um, I grew up in a low income family and I've experienced all different types of uh, aggressions, microaggressions, and racism growing up, and some of it implicit, some of it explicit, and so have my students. And I see the world through certain filters. And in order for me to remove some of those filters or to open my eyes to my own bias, I had to confront those things in and of, my, in and of, of myself. Um, and I think as educators right now, more than ever, we are needed to be more than our content. Um, my students can learn biology from, from professors and knowledge about cells from people who are far more sophisticated than I am from universities on YouTube. So what's my role as an educator? My role is to be able to build relationships and be able to knock out the barriers and help them to knock out the barriers so they can have help happier and healthier lives and more educated lives and move up in the world and so break down some of these systems that have been perpetuated for, for time. So I wanted to find some terms. Uh, first is equity. And when I use that term, I'm describing by analogy who has uh, keys to the room. And for inclusion, I'm describing who's in the room. And then for diversity, it represents the, the types of people that are in the room. And we all have different levels of diversity and inclusion. Um, and before we attack it, we kind of have to identify locally, what does that look like in my school? What does that look like in my site? See, this work, this big work that we're doing, especially in this movement of anti-bias and anti-racist teaching, is it's difficult to do at scale. And so when we're doing this work and we're thinking about equity, it's going to be different for every school and every district. Now, there's a great graphic that I really appreciated um, by Deepa Iyer, uh, and you can follow her on Twitter. She created this. 
And this shows our role in this social change ecosystem. And we all identify in certain roles. And I know during Black Lives Matter, when there were protests, many people felt conflicted because they wanted to be part of it, but their personality and how they're wired wasn't necessarily the person in the street. And in this image, you can see there's different ways to have a role in this social change ecosystem. You have healers and you have artists, you have builders and visionaries, you have disruptors who are, who are courageous and ask the hard questions and who live out loud. They're like the megaphone. You have the caregivers and you have the bridge builders and all of those people are needed. And I know even for myself as an educator, I found it difficult to live in these different intersectionalities where as an educator, my role is to educate and ultimately bring people to a higher level of consciousness to remove some of these barriers. But yet I also have these deep emotions inside that I wrestled with and finding outlets or ways to both be productive, but still be heard uh, was difficult. And so I felt that this was very empowering because some of these resonate with more of you than others. And my challenge and encouragement to you is to find something that resonates with you and run with that. Because it's very easy to see the people who live out loud the most and think I need to be that. Find where your strength is and start there. Now there's a few misconceptions with equity um, and culturally relevant teaching. I just wanna identify some. It's not the same as multicultural or social justice education. Even though I'm weaving it in here, I thought it would be important because sometimes the terms are synonymous. Um, it doesn't always start with addressing implicit bias. It doesn't always start with addressing privilege. These aren't necessarily the topics. Those are more topics for social justice education, multicultural education, anti-bias, anti-racist teaching. They, are, they do overlap. Um, but for us, what we're talking about today is some of these tools that will help empower you if you already have that lens that you see your curriculum through, that you see your teaching through. So you're already going into the classroom thinking about math, thinking about your second grade students, thinking about biology, and you're thinking about it through this lens of deconstructing these systems that have been in place for years. Now, what are some tools that can help turbo boost what you're trying to do in the classroom? Um, so some of the truths of our students, uh, many come from oral traditions and oral traditions is one of the ways that we turn um, kind of meaningless knowledge into something valuable. They also come from collectivistic cultures. And as Americans, this can be really challenging because we're very much as a culture, identity is very much an American culture is very I over we. Whereas many of the students that we serve, it's very we over I, it's a collectivist community. And we can have a cultural conflict there, not understanding how our role when we're serving students in a collectivistic culture can be perceived. And there could be a lot of room for misconceptions there. Last, culturally responsive teachings designed to incre increase rigor and cognition. Those are the two things that are really important is providing students that deeper learning. So moving further in that depth of knowledge or uh, moving higher up in that, blooms, in that blooms chart. We also wanna develop intrinsic motivation. And so when we establish inclusion in the classroom, we're creating a learning atmosphere where the teacher and the student feels respected. We're, we're creating an attitude for students that makes learning favorable. A lot of the students that come into our classroom are coming with experiences that were negative towards learning, experiences that we didn't create, but yet we still feel the impact of those. And so when we're developing this culturally responsive teaching, we're deconstructing those negative experiences and replacing them with positive ones. We're also creating thoughtful challenges. So that's where that rigor comes in, pushing students beyond what they think they could do. And we're making the learning valuable to them. So we're connecting the learning experience to something that's meaningful. Now, Gloria Ladson Billings had six uh, pillars of culturally responsive teaching. I'm only gonna focus on two for today. The first is relationships and the second is rigor um, because we can talk for a long time about all six, but these tools are gonna be designed to focus on these two areas, relationships and rigor. Now, this is a, a pretty popular uh, image that's been used for equality, equity, and reality. And this is something that's been in the media a lot and talking about equality is everyone getting the same thing, equity, everyone getting what they need, but then the reality is, uh, the people who have end up having more and the people who don't have um, get even less. And I relate this back to when I was 18, 
when I was 18 years old, I left home and I was homeless for six months and I had no money in the bank. And that's when I learned that the bank charges you for being poor. And so I had no money. And then I got a bill when I went to my bank that I had negative $20. So when you're, when you're broke, you get charged for being broke. You get negative money, which I didn't even know a bank account could do. And then when you're wealthy, the bank gives you extra money for being wealthy. And that perfectly depicted what this uh, reality uh, segment of this chart shows. Now, when you're dealing with tech, equity, there's two questions uh, you want to answer. One, does the tech uh, provide deeper learning and doesn't it help our students express their funds of knowledge or their identity better? And the second one is, does it empower all students um, to contribute to learning? If it doesn't, then maybe technology isn't the right tool for the job because tech is just a tool. Um, it's, it's not the be all end all. Now I know under the circumstances of us doing distance learning, we kind of rely on it. Um, but when we're in, the, we're in the classroom, sometimes it's not the right tool for the job. And so we wanna make sure we ask those questions. So here are some practical strategies that I've used and encouraged teachers to use over the years. And again, starting with relationships. The first is a Google form. And this is a simple Google form uh, feedback survey to get some background information about students. Because again, it's about building relationships. Our students, if we were a business, they're our clients. And if we took our classroom and put it in the market space, would you get repeat customers? That's a question that I ask myself. Would my students come back? Um, when I look at them through that lens as my clients, and I look at them through this lens of service. But in order for me to better serve my students, I need to know about them. So this is one of the forms that I've created. It's a student feedback form, and I do it in the first week of school. Now, before I share this with students and ask for information from them, I share my story first. And you're going to hear this as being a constant theme of storytelling. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as to why. But I want to know who my students are. And with 200 kids in the classroom, it would take me almost half a school year to know them to the depth that I really want to know them because I only really see them twice a week on a block schedule. And then on a Wednesday, we have half days. To really identify the needs of my students, um, I, need, I need some info faster. So here are some of the questions that I ask. And I've shared this form in the resources that'll be shared at the end. Um, so just go ahead and watch. And in the end, you'll be able to make a copy of it and modify it uh, for your own needs. So I ask their name and class period, um, any nicknames they like. And then I check to see whether they, they have access to internet at home, because this is gonna inform how I teach and how I deliver assignments and projects. Do they have a working computer? Do they live with anyone? Parents or both parents? Do they have pets? Um, is there anything about their living situation that I should know that might impact their learning in the classroom? What's your favorite YouTube channel? Usually I get about 10 different responses on that. What do they like to do in their free time? And then one of my favorite questions is what makes you smile no matter what? Because if I can know that, I can know how to connect and encourage and love my students. There's this book called The Five Love Languages. And the premise of the book is that there's all these different types of languages and of love. And with it, certain languages speak to us more loudly than others. What if we knew that about all of our students? Would it be easier to build relationships with them? I have a rule that I try to have and live by in the classroom is three deposits for every withdrawal. And a deposit would be like an emotional deposit. So three positive interactions with a student before I need to make a critique, criticism, or feedback that might be perceived as negative. And I teach middle school, seventh grade. I'm gonna be making some withdrawals, but I don't wanna put my students in a situation of negative funds. And see, a lot of us have grown up, if you've grown up in a household like I did, where it's all criticism, no praise, a lot of times, it's not intuitive to be overly positive, but think about it like a bank account. If I'm always withdrawing emotional funds from a student, more than I'm making emotional deposits, what's my relationship gonna look like? What's my behavior management in the classroom gonna look like? What's learning gonna look like? What's the community gonna look like? Moving on, what are you really good at? One of the most telling answers to this question is when a student says, I don't know, or nothing. That's already cluing me in to my social, emotional learning and thinking about where the student kind of perceives their ability level. What's the hardest thing you've ever done? And then the last one is what should Mr. Cross know about you that's gonna make me a better teacher? 
once I have this, then I have a spreadsheet of all of my student information in the first week. And I go through this and I highlight certain sections that I need to really key on, key, uh, key in on um, to make sure, hey, look, this flags me. I got to make sure I find out who the student is and really work on this relationship and making deposits. Um, and so now I have all of this quantifiable soft data that would have taken me a long time to figure out organically throughout the school year. Next is parents and partners. And this is more important now than ever. Um, one of the ways to do this is relationship building. And so using Google Voice, and this is really good now, especially with distance learning, but I use this in the classroom for years. Google Voice gives you a free phone number. And I use this on my cell phone. I have a Google Voice number. I call it my burner number uh, because I can turn it off and on. And I use that for my classroom phone. This way I can communicate with parents, but I could also shut off the Google Voice when I don't wanna receive calls. I can text parents. I can even screen calls because Google Voice will screen who's calling. And when you answer the phone, it tells you who it is and you can decide to accept or decline, but the caller only hears the call continuously ring. So they don't know that they got side buttoned. So as a teacher, Google Voice has been awesome for us. And what I did when I was in the physical classroom is in that first week of school, when I drove home, I would look at my most critical relationships I needed to build first, and I'd make five phone calls home. So instead of Spotify or NPR, I'd make five phone calls home, five positive phone calls home and build that relationship with a parent. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, this is Eric Cross. I'm Johnny's new science teacher. I'm really excited to have him in class. Today in class, Johnny was participating in this cup stacking activity as a team. He was so enthusiastic about it. And he, uh, it looks like he's going to be a lot of fun to have in the classroom. You know your son better than anybody. Is there anything that I can do or anything that I should know that's going to make me a better teacher? I've gotten responses. And usually I make that phone call home and I start with the students that I'm really going to need relationships with the most. These are a lot of times students who typically have a lot of struggles in the classroom because those are the relationships that I want to go after immediately because I want to leverage my relationship with them, not my authority, but it takes intentionality. A lot of times I get on the phone, the parents like, are, did you call the right number? Are you, are you sure? And what have I done? I built a relationship and it's genuine. I identified something. I looked for something that was positive and that gave me that reason to call home. Once I've done this over a course of a week or two, I've made several calls and I've already established allies with parents. Many teachers have walked into the buzzsaw of making your first contact to a parent via email about the kid not doing something they weren't supposed to. So, and that's usually not until months into the semester. And what kind of response do you get? A lot of times it's not always positive because a lot of times that student has already gone home and told stories or built a framework that the parent sees you through. So there hasn't been a relationship built there. There's no allyship. And so when the parent and the teacher are on the same page, you can better serve the needs of the student. Next is using our basic cell phone. So many of us, I know we're back and forth. My school is, we don't know if we're gonna go distance learning, hybrid, full-time in the classroom, wearing hazmat suits like Breaking Bad. We're gonna be doing some, but at some point in time, we're gonna see our kids. What I would do is take phone, would take images of my students and email them to parents when they were at work. This is Markel. Markel transferred to our school and it, it, he, he wasn't part of our community building process. And so it was tough for him. And he was taking, he was feeding our turtle, which is now right next to me since it's home with me now. And I took a picture of him. I said, what's your mom's email address? He says, why? And I said, because I bet your mom has never seen you act actively in the classroom. And so many times parents get phone calls home from the school and what's the emotion that they feel? Dread. Usually it's not, yes, the school's calling. Usually it's, oh, why are they calling? So now mom, dad's sitting at work, they get an email pop up on their phone and it's their son and daughter doing something amazing. How many teachers have done that in the past for that student? How do you think that's gonna frame how you're perceived by that parent, the value you create for that student and the family. You're building a relationship and you're doing it intentionally. And one of the great things is that with Google Photos, you have unlimited storage with your teacher account. So I have photos from 2014 of my students that are now in college. Um, 
And sometimes I'll see them in public and I'll, while they're eating dinner, I'll pull them up and show them on my phone. Um, and in our, in our culture now with social media, people love photos. And so being able to do that small thing is a great way to build relationships. But it's also important to know that students, just because they're great with social media, doesn't mean that they have 21st century skills. So these current skills that are needed, word processing, web browsing, coding, PowerPoint, they don't necessarily translate. So it's also important to put an emphasis on digital literacy um, beyond just the social media aspect of things. For schools, it's important to make sure that your website is mobile friendly um, and that they're cloud-based. A third of our families that are low income access the internet primarily through a smartphone. And I don't know if you've ever been on a website that wasn't mobile friendly. It's extremely aggravating. On top of that, imagine your phone's cracked or you have limited Wi-Fi accessibility. Simply by making sure that your websites are mobile friendly is a way to create equity for those families to ensure that they have access to the knowledge that they need. When we went distance learning, we created a new website for our seventh grade team using a Google site um, that was mobile friendly and simplified that had the basic answers to questions that parents needed. What does my student need to do? When are the live sessions? How do I contact teachers? Simple was better. That's what our parents needed. And we made sure that it was translated both in English and Spanish because that's the majority languages that our parents speak. And this was something that our parents gave us feedback on and told us that that was incredibly valuable. We have a school website, but that has all of the information on there. We wanted to make something that was simple and easy to navigate that would supplement our main school's website. Next is synchronous and asynchronous teaching. So having, be, having tools to support both. Asynchronous teaching simply means that students are learning on their own time. Synchronous teaching would be when your students are learning live. Like right now, if you're live in this video, you're doing synchronous learning. I'm talking, you're, you're listening in real time. There are platforms that support both and having access to both helps you serve the needs of more students. If we go completely asynchronous, then students don't have the ability to interact in real time with their teachers and ask questions when they're stuck. And a lot of times there's a delay. When you go completely synchronous, that limits the time that students could have access to information because they might not all be able to log in at the same time. Some students might be able to work easier at nine o'clock in the morning. Some might be able to work easier at nine o'clock PM. And those are different groups of students. So how do we serve the needs of both? Well, by using platforms, that allow us to do both things. So websites like Canvas and Google Classroom allow you to put information online that students can access at any time. And then doing things like office hours, live sessions that are optional for students, give the ability for students to check in with teachers if they need the additional support. And so by having both asynchronous and synchronous options for students, we're able to serve the needs of more kids. I live in San Diego. Some of my students go back and forth across the Mexico border. When my students are across the border, some of them may not have access to Wi-Fi. If I did all synchronous lessons and required them to be there live, I'm now creating a systemic hindrance to them being able to do, to do their learning. Now, a few other pieces is engagement. So using websites like Screencastify to do flipped lessons where you record videos of yourself doing instruction are incredibly powerful. And then using things like SnapLens to make it fun. And so if you're not familiar with SnapLens, uh, SnapLens is a program uh, from Snapchat. And what you can do with it is you can put neat little filters on it. And if I wanted to say change, let's see if I have my, oh, my camera is not, oh, it's not working. Let's see if I can turn it on. There we go. During our Zoom sessions, if I wanted to change, I can make my webcam uh, look different. If I wanted a younger version of myself, uh, you can see there's a younger version of me. And so SnapLens is just a fun way if you're doing live instruction on Zoom or on a Google Meet session, you can change the way you look while you're doing it. Let's go ahead and turn that off. and then using web tools to enhance your videos. So right now I'm using a uh, external webcam and a microphone, and here's why. 
students, many of our students spend a lot of time watching videos on YouTube. And I've been doing a lot of distance learning for students. The end user experience is really important for engagement. For instance, if I, let's say, change my video to my computer webcam, tell me if you see a difference. And so now I'm on my computer webcam and now the experience is a little bit different. Now I'm looking down and talking to you and I'm already a tall guy. So this is probably what my students normally see. I'm 6'4". So I'm looking down and this is a completely different experience. So if I'm recording videos or doing live instruction, just the feel of it just feels off or it feels different. On top of that, if I change my microphone and just use my computer microphone, um, or as I'm doing now, but if I switch microphones and use my external microphone, now my, my voice sounds a little bit different. Now this external microphone is just a, a basic one that I, we had at school, but even using the ones that come with your cell phone, using the microphones like this that are come with your iPhone or your Android can make a, whole, a huge difference in sound quality. Also digital tablets. Digital tablets are great for annotating, um, kind of like a Khan Academy or if you're a math teacher, there are digital tablets available at Amazon um, that are relatively inexpensive. They're about $40, but it makes a huge difference versus being able to write with a mouse. And I've been encouraging teachers, if they could, to invest a little bit, at least in a webcam or a digital tablet, because there's a lot of value in these videos that you create if you do flip lessons. Because for me, what they do is they become a co-teacher. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, I'm a teacher just like you. And so anything that's free 99, anything that's low cost, I'm all about. So behind me, you see this kind of green screen, which is just fabric. But you can go to Walmart and buy one of those green tablecloths for $1.50, $1.79. And that could be a green screen. On top of that, as you saw when I changed my camera lens and I looked down, simply by elevating your computer, you can make it so it's eye level. So you're looking directly at it when you're talking to students. And if you're gonna invest the time in making flip lessons and doing videos, why not make it as high quality as possible? Now, dot cameras. This is one of the questions that a lot of teachers have asked me about is dot cameras. One of the great things you can do is if you have a tablet, you can actually log in to your live sessions, either on Google Meet or Zoom through your tablet and make that a new user in the meeting and simply use it as a dot cam. So by, I have this right now on top of a cup um, and that was my dot camera that I was using. And this is a great for Google Meet or for Zoom live sessions. So now you're able to demonstrate things in real time um, without having to have a big contraption of moving your webcam or folding down your screen. Um, you can just log in with another device and this also works with your phone. So if you have your phone and you log into a Zoom session or you log into a Google Meet session, you can use that as a dot camera as well. Now I spoke a little earlier about screencasting yourself. And if you're not familiar with this, a screencast is essentially a video of yourself and your screen where you're doing some kind of instruction on something. Now I started screencasting years ago because I wanted it to be my substitute teacher. Because when I remember substitutes, the teacher would write this long letter and then they'd give it to the substitute and then the substitute would just read it and then we were expected to do it. And there was always this disconnect between what the substitute said and what we actually did. So I realized that and I said, I wonder what would happen if I started screencasting. So then all of my sub lessons were simply videos of me speaking to my students, giving them instruction on what I want them to do. And then I started noticing that the productivity and the connection increased. On top of that, they were using my videos on the instruction to guide them. So then all I needed in the classroom was a functional adult. That was all I needed because I didn't know who was gonna come in every day. So I just needed somebody to make sure my kids were safe and had access to the material. My videos that I spent time recording became the instruction. And from there, I had a bank of videos that I started creating. I had a bank of, of YouTube videos that I made for my flipped lessons. And here is where this became helpful and helped me serve more students. These lessons that I had that were flipped allowed for remediation. So if my students who needed additional instruction were able to go back and watch my videos and my enriched students or my students that were advanced were able to go and watch future videos. 
And what did that do? It freed me up during live sessions to go to move around the classroom to support students who needed that live one on one. And the great thing about YouTube is it takes what you say and it auto transcribes it. So students can turn on the captions and watch and build their literacy as they're listening to you in real time. It also promotes students to become more self directed because once they're in a habit of looking for your resources online, now they're able to go and pursue their own learning or go back and uh, review anything that they didn't quite understand. Now, it's not just about making videos. It's also important about remembering that our students' attention spans, um, a lot of times, are proportional to their developmental level. And so making videos that were appropriate length. Um, and so I tried to make my videos bite-sized so that students were able to move through different segments at a time. It's great to make screencasts, but if you make a 20 or 30 minute screencast, don't expect younger learners to wanna to watch it, no matter how engaging you are. It's nothing personal, but think about yourself on YouTube. A lot of times I'll scroll through a video until I get to the meat of what I wanna learn. So simply by chunking down your videos into smaller segments and making a playlist can be really effective. And if you've spent a year making videos on Elements of your teaching that you teach every year, even if they're just procedural things. How many times do you teach students about your syllabus or about checking out computers from the cart or how to log into Google Classroom? Take some of those procedural things and make videos on it. Have students watch it and that's where they learn those procedures. That frees you up to do other things in the classroom. You can also forward those videos to parents so they can support their students at home because they can watch alongside alongside them. We spoke about this a little earlier, using web-based, uh, cloud-based websites when possible. Um, next is a tool from Microsoft that I really like. So in Google Slides, which is what I'm using now, there's a neat feature that takes your voice, your speech, and puts it into text. And this is built in and it's free. So I'm gonna demonstrate that right now with slides. So we're just gonna go down to captions. And now in captions, what should happen is right here at the top, you can see everything that I say um, put into text in real time. Now, this is a great way to get your students to read. Now, my students love reading this because they look for mistakes. And whatever I can do, again, I'm a seventh grade teacher, whatever I can do to get my kids to read because we're all teachers of literacy. Um, that's a shout out for you, Dr. Latimer. Uh, we are all teachers of literacy. So whatever I can do to get them to read, um, I'm doing. So this is built into Google Slides, but one of the drawbacks to it is it's only in English. So it's only English to English translation. Now, what I know from Google is that they are rolling out translation into other languages, but let me show you something that works now. So as an educator, you have access to free Office 365 through your public school account. So if you teach at a public school, um, you have free Office 365 which means that's Microsoft's version of Google Apps. And in there is PowerPoint. Watch what PowerPoint can do. Here, I can choose my spoken language and I can also choose my subtitle language. And for now, I'm gonna have it in Spanish. And when I present from the current slide, what'll happen is as I'm speaking, it will translate in real time the words that I say in English into Spanish. And there's over a hundred languages that it can be translated into. How valuable would this be for you teaching at a school that serves a population of students that speak multiple native languages? What about when you're doing a parent-teacher conference or an orientation for parents? What if parents were able to have access to Chromebooks open in front of them and they were able to see live translations or dictations in front of them? Would this be another way to be able to communicate and reach and build relationships with more populations of your students. And that's built into PowerPoint and it's free. And again, there's over a hundred languages that are translated there. Next are some other resources for communication. And one of my favorite ones uh, is one called Talking Points. Talking Points allows you to send text messages uh, to parents and to students. It's a third party platform. So everything kind of goes to a hub. So it keeps transparency there. But what it does is it translates the text message into the mother tongue or the native language of whoever the recipient is. 
they're able to communicate in their own native language and then it'll translate back to your default language. And as of now, there's over a hundred languages uh, that it translates into. So now you're able to reach more populations of the families that you serve and language is not a barrier. So both with PowerPoint and with talking points and it's free for teachers. It's an app you can download on your iPhone or an app you can download onto an Android device. It's a freemium service. So there are kind of uh, more upgraded ways of features that you can use, but the free version typically is, is sufficient. There are a few other platforms like Remind and Blooms. Both of those allow you to text message uh, families and students, but it keeps transparency. So there's, there's nothing um, hidden in the communication. Everything is logged and there's parent waivers and things like that. So it's a way to kind of protect parents, teachers, and students because a lot of our students communicate via text message. There's also WhatsApp. And we realize that many of our families, I teach in an IB school, we have a large population of families from other countries. One of the primary ways that they communicate is through WhatsApp. And so it didn't make sense that we were sending text message blasts with phone numbers that always change, but we weren't using WhatsApp. That was the platform that our families were on. And a lot of times phone numbers can change, but people's WhatsApp number, WhatsApp ident identity doesn't change. They move back and forth and go to different places. Usually that remains the same longer than an address or a phone number. So considering other ways to reach your community beyond just the traditional email that a lot of times goes to a spam filter. If you've ever been frustrated or you find that you don't get a lot of responses from your parent community, Sometimes teachers default and go, well, parents, they just don't care. They're not connected. And that's probably one of the most unhealthy mindsets um, to have. What I challenge is investigate that and dive a little deeper, maybe collect some data and find out if parents are receiving the communications and why they're not responding and maybe consider one of these other tools. Now, again, being able to build relationships with students. One of my favorite websites has been a website called Thrively. Um, Thrively is another freemium service. We have all of our students do it during homeroom. And what it does is it gives students an inventory of 80 questions. And once you're finished and you've created a classroom, you have a strength assessment with all of the aspirations, goals, and kind of a personality profile of each of your students. We have our students print this out and then we put them up on the wall. And again, this is giving me soft data about my kids. It tells me where their areas of strength are. For Roman specifically, Roman read it. He was one of the first ones done. And I said, Roman, what did you think about your profile? And I go, is this true? And he says, yeah, but I don't know. I don't like it. I go, why? He goes, because it only tells me the good stuff. And I said, yeah, man, that's the point. These are your strengths. And for him, he looked at it. And many students, especially in middle school and high school, where we're seeking our identity and trying to figure out where we fit in socially, having something that kind of hones in on where you stand out is extremely validating. And where you're the teacher who empowered a student to be able to know more about themselves or be able to celebrate their strengths, that's another deposit that you're making. And again, we're building those bridges with our students. This is kind of an overview of some of our students. Um, this is Roman's aspirations. So I knew that he was in academics, that he loved the outdoors and he liked cooking and public speaking. And I can definitely tell you that Roman liked public speaking all of the time. So this was something that I can validate for him as a teacher that these results are definitely accurate. When you're using Thrively, you'll have a class snapshot. So you'll be able to see all of your students at a glance in a dashboard. And then you'll have some kind of uh, statistics on where your students kind of stand out the most. And so we had a lot of analytical and flexible students, our IB students. So all that's to say, you've collected all the soft data, you know your students. What's the why behind this? There's a purpose. It's not just gathering data and knowing our students. We live and have lived in a society where we become very tribal. And I say we, and we see this in all different ways, whether it's politics, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's religion, whether it's nationalism. Humans do that. As a biology teacher, we do it because we do it for safety. When we perceive others as a threat and we can identify who the threat is and who's safe, then I know where to draw the lines. The problem is, is higher order thinking creatures um, that creates more problems than it solves. And we identify people as threats who are not threats and we dehumanize them. 
And in order for me to do harm to another person and justify it morally, I first need to dehumanize them so that I can justify why I'm doing wrong to them. And so what's the antidote to that? Now we see this, I see this in middle school all the time because they're like, they're like little adults with no money. Like they're so raw in their emotions. And so they're, we, they're clicky and tribal, but like adults are the same way. We're just more sophisticated and we wear masks. And so they form these tribes, but, and then they dehumanize. And so the answer is how do we rehumanize? How do we create empathy? How do we create connection so that we build bridges instead of burn them? And one of the ways is through telling our story. And this goes back to the relationships. And so there's a few different curriculums that are out there that are free that we've used. One is StoryCorps, and this is from NPR. StoryCorps equips students to be able to interview other people and record stories. There's little mini projects where they sit and listen as the interviewer. And then they also practice telling their story. The more frequent we tell our story and the more frequent we listen to each other's story, it forces me to humanize you and it forces you to humanize me. See, we build stories around facts. We see something happen and our brains construct the reality, true or not, because that's who we are as humans. That's what we do. We, our brains do not like to live in ambiguity. But a lot of times, the narratives that we build around the facts aren't always true. And they kind of lean towards our cognitive um, biases um, or the framework that we see the world in. And so the way to deconstruct that is to continue telling stories my story and my student's story. And that's why in the first day or two of school, I start by telling my story, how I grew up, where I'm from and why I became a teacher. Because I never wanna ask my students to do something, especially if it's vulnerable that I haven't done first. And one thing that I've realized with a lot of teachers is you don't realize that you have a story. Um, we were just watching Hamilton again, uh, it's on Disney Plus and uh, it says, you can't control who lives, who dies, who tells your story. And we all have a story. You might not think your story is exciting. You might not think your story is like someone else's, but you should never compare your stories to other people because it only produces one or two things. It either produces pride or despair. You're never gonna come out as a more self-actualized person if you're comparing your stories to other people. And that just goes with comparing ourselves with people in general. Um, my story is my story, this is who I am. And when I do that, it builds a connection with the student. I'm no longer a two-dimensional teacher. I'm a three-dimensional human. And it works the same way in return from our kids. The next project we do is Post Secret. This is a grown-up version that we've middle school middle schoolerized. So Post Secret, it was designed by a, a, as a concept for adults to take a secret that they never told anybody, put it on a postcard, and mail it in. And then the designer put them all up kind of as a collage and you can walk through and see all the stories. Uh, this one says, I give decaf to, rude cu to customers who are rude to me from Starbucks. Now, if you go on the link and you go to the Post Secret website, they are the adult versions of that. So I, I'm just telling you now, teachers, that's not something that you wanna use to direct students to, but we did a middle school version of this. So after we built community, after we built these relationships, after we built this trust, after we've made these deposits, then we had students use Google Slides and we had them make their own post secrets. They get to write anonymously and share a story that they've never shared with anyone else or they've never told anybody. And we gave students two options. They could either turn in their slide on Google Classroom if they felt safe with their teacher or we created anonymous boxes where students can put it in the box. And all of these activities are voluntary, 100%. Anything that has to do with this type of learning some students aren't at a point where they want to tell their story. Some students aren't at a point where they want to share a secret. And that's okay. Because when other people in the community are, they still feel connected. This is not something that's like a worksheet in a math class or a science project. This is a heart project. And simply participating in projects like this as a community is, creates value internally, even if you don't see it manifested externally. So we put up all their secrets in the wall and we had a range of secrets that were expressed. We had some that said, um, I used to sit on hamburgers before I ate them. Like you do. Uh, we had others that said, um, 
during communion, I gave my sister uh, a glass that I peed in and told her it was apple juice. That was from one of our teachers. And she later affirmed that it happened when she was nine years old. So a little bit less judgment there. What happened when we put this up? This project was outside my door and it had students clustered around it for the whole year. Not only my grade level students, but also sixth and eighth graders. Because what happens when you do this is it does two things. See, secrets create psychological tension. And when you express it in a place where you can feel safe, it one, allows you to release psychological energy, and two, it allows other people to not feel alone because many students walk up to it and go, hey, me too. So what's that doing? It's allowing our students to be able to build bridges with each other. It's allowing them to reduce some of that psychological energy and shame and all of those things that our kids bring into the classroom before we even try to get them to learn about Pythagorean theorem and CER. Um, it removes those barriers and allows us to do what? To build those relationships, to make the environment feel safe. Next is the human library. And again, all of these projects are gonna be shared at the end in the resources, there'll be links to everything. Human library is a project where people are books and students can check out people and you have a, an event. And what happens is a student gets to choose a stereotype that they've been identified as, a negative stereotype and terms that have been said to them. And they get to have an open, safe conversation asking questions um, to each other about it. See, a lot of times, depending on the family that you grew up on or grew up with, uh, certain conversations are off limits. We learn this about race. A lot of teachers were raised in families where you didn't talk about race, or you were simply told that I don't see color. And then many people realized as they got older how horrible or negative that was, because if you don't see color, you don't see me. And then you lived with this conflict internally where I was doing what I was raised. And then you had to come to this realization of what you were raised was actually harmful as opposed to helpful, even though the intention was good, the impact wasn't. And there's not, it's always that gap, right? That's our blind spot, the difference between our intention and our impact. And we all have it. Um, and so this created an opportunity where students could have open conversations about things that they really wondered about. We had students from our um, GSA, our Gay Straight Alliance Club that, were, that came down, our students that identified as transgender or our students that were questioning, and they were open to other students asking questions. And what did that do? It removed stigma. And it allowed students to be able to have open and honest conversations and listen to each other and create empathy. Next is the moth. And I've included in the resources, the curriculum for the moth. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, the moth storytelling hour, is another tool to help tell your story. There are five to seven minute stories um, that, we, uh, that you tell, similar to like a mini TED talk, but it's a personal story of something that you've experienced. We'll wrap it up into like the last 10 minutes. So I do wanna highlight a couple of other things. In Google, there's a website called Google Tour Creator. And this allows students to create a virtual reality tour of anywhere in the world. So the way we use this is I had students create a VR tour of their home of their life. And this is Keyshawn. So Keyshawn came to us from Alabama. And what it does is it uses all the images from the Google Street View car and it gives you access to it. And then you could stitch together a narrative. So what if you did a project where your students can choose their top five colleges and they created a VR tour of all those five colleges, or you can take them to the pyramids. You can even take them scuba diving. And all of this is free and you can use this as a project. In addition to that, you're also exposing students to virtual reality. And they're doing what? They're telling a story using technology. So again, through your pedagogy, through your curriculum, through these tools, you're reinforcing the storytelling element. And that's one thing that I wanna encourage you and or challenge you as you go into the next year is to look at your content and your pedagogy through the lens of storytelling. How do I get my students to tell their story and hear each other's story? because through that, you're gonna lay the groundwork for some of these heavier conversations. A lot of schools and teachers have been asking the question, how do we eliminate racism and do all this anti-bias, anti-racist uh, anti training all of a sudden? And you can't just bring in a speaker to speak to 1500 people and think it's gonna go away. This work needs to be done when the tide is low so that when the tide rises, 
you have the systems in place to be able to support kids. So it's kind of like we needed to rely on all these relationships that we built, but then we didn't build the relationships. It's kind of like, or a savings account, right? You need money, but you weren't saving. And so as we go into this next year, we need to make sure that we're intentionally building this into our curriculum. We need to be more than just what our content says. So again, this is Keyshawn's uh, jump zone area in Alabama. This is where he used to go to the movie theater. This was his old school. This is one of those uh, jump zone trampoline parks, or I call them spiral tibia fracture parks. And the Dairy Queen. I learned so much about Keyshawn by watching this. And then students shared them with each other and they watched each other's VR experiences. And they don't have to do it with a VR headset. You don't need a fancy device. A student can do it on their cell phone. They could do it on a, on a Chromebook, on any digital device they have, it doesn't matter. But now they're experiencing the life of someone else. Some students realize that ki some kids live in food deserts, that it's privileged to live next to a Trader Joe's or a Sprouts or a Whole Foods. When everything you see on the corner in some kids' experience is gun store, liquor store, gun store, liquor store, and other kids' experience, um, there's parks all around and they're at the same school. That brings up some interesting conversations in the classroom. Last is identity slides. So we use these identity slides. Uh, we did this as a team in Homeroom. Um, it starts off with just this one slide. A student has to create a slide and there's some requirements for it. So they need to leave the school logo on there. They put three things about themselves. It needs to be all visual, uh, the birthplace, where they're from. And then we put them all together in one master slideshow. And then we show that slideshow on loop during open house or during the classroom day or at the front desk. And this is what shows up. And so in these slides, since they're visual, students are learning how to create a digital presentation but they're also expressing themselves. And I'm getting to learn a lot more about who my students are and their experiences and what they value. This is Mia's. And this is Brendan. And this is, uh, I, wanna, I wanna end with Brendan. So Brendan in sixth grade lost both of his parents in a motorcycle accident. They were both hit by a drunk driver and killed both of his parents. In sixth grade, Brendan became a selective mute. He stopped talking. I knew this coming into seventh grade. Brendan didn't really speak. He, he participated in work. He was very kind of solemn, just very calm. And I knew he had experienced a lot of trauma. And to be honest, like I didn't know what to do aside from just doing what I do with my other students. So this project came up and it came up about halfway through the years, after, halfway through the school year. This is after we've done all these other projects that I've shared with you the background, the storytelling, him listening to other people's stories all the time. Brennan never shared. He never talked about his parents' death. And then we did this project and Brennan was on his computer during class and he was working on it. And I went over and I looked and he put this image of his parents. This is the first time that he had ever publicly shared anything that had happened about his, to his parents. And at the end of the school year, students write letters sometimes. And he wrote a letter to me um, and uh, it said, hey, Mr. Cross, thanks for the school year. He said, um, as you know, I lost my parents and I wanna thank you for this year because you reminded me of my dad. And if, he didn't have those experiences to be able to create those relationships. We never would have been able to get to that point. Now, since then I've taught his younger sister and he's now in high school and he's doing well. Um, he's still a developing young man and doing what young men do. But nothing that I did was magic. It was just intentional. You know, I'm not a...
I think Eric is having some technical difficulties right now. Um, hmm, Brian, what would you suggest? We just wait for him to pop back on, but we're really quite at the end here. Yeah, we can see if he's able to rejoin us. I mean, yeah, it's unfortunate that he froze <laughs> at that time because there's uh, just a very personal personal story <laughs> and uh, to finish off on, but. So, yeah, someone said bummer, like a cliffhanger. That's yeah. <laughs> very I'm, true. I'm sure he'll try to rejoin us as soon as, as, soon as he can, yeah. but maybe we'll start to wrap up in the meantime. Yeah, this was great. I think his whole point of you have to build those relationships before you can even teach the content is what it is all about. So do you think we should end the session and just pop over to, there he is, hi. Welcome back, Eric. I think you're on mute. Can you unmute? <laughs> hey, I'm on my phone. Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't know how far I got. Did I finish the story about Brandon? You didn't. You left us on a cliffhanger. <laughs> did I? Yeah. You did, didn't I, want to finish did I that tell quickly. you about the letter? You were talking about that, yes. So, Brandon, did I tell you what Brandon said in his letter? Yes. So um, I think, so Brennan said, you remind me of my dad. And yes. uh, my story is that I'm a product of people who cared about me that didn't have to. And I, um, through the relationship, Brennan was able to make a breakthrough. And I, I said that I'm not a, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor. I'm just a guy who loves kids, who loves teaching and who knows a little bit about tech. And by being intentional about using this technology to be able to create relationships, I was able to build a culture in the classroom um, that was positive. And it's important for us as teachers, we need to be thermostats, not thermometers. A thermometer responds to whatever the temperature is, but a thermostat controls it. And if we don't create the culture, our students will. And the culture that our 12 and 13 and 14 year olds will create, um, may not be the culture that you want in the classroom. And so we have to be, we have to be intentional about that. So I hope um, anyone who's listening to the call uh, was able to find something of value that they can go and apply um, in their school or in their classroom. Yes, definitely. And I was a seventh grade teacher for a long time. So uh, I you totally know, you know, you. You know. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta build those relationships. That's what it's all about. Um, I think this is a great time to wrap up and head over to the debrief session for a further discussion. And Brian dropped the link there in the chat. Eric, I want to make sure you have that because I know you're joining us. Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to get it on the computer. Um, let's see. Couldn't jump in with everybody. I think Zoom. Zoom got mad at me. <laughs> it happens. It does. Is the, uh, let's see, is the link, maybe I can jump in on my phone and then get over there. Let's see, chat. Yeah, you're getting lots of great comments and lots of gratitude in the chat here. So hopefully oh, people will join us in the discussion room.